So for 40 plus years, I've enjoyed a career in venture capital. When I started in the 1960s, it was a cottage industry. Nobody knew the term. And less than $100 million was raised each year and invested in private companies. Four decades later, venture capital is a respected asset class. Approximately $20 billion is raised annually in a, and in a Darwinian process is invested in the most exciting technology startups and growth companies. I've seen the power when you combine talented, passionate entrepreneurs with tier one venture capital financing. It's created companies that have changed your life and mine, like Apple and Facebook, and it's helped start whole new industries like biotechnology. 10 years ago, my wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And frankly, I was appalled when some of the best doctors told me, try 3-Advil a day, it might help. Try Lipitor, it might help. And oh yes, there are some Alzheimer's drugs like Reminil and Aricept, they won't help. This for a disease that was discovered more than 100 years ago, affects 5.5 million Americans today, and if we don't find a cure, will affect 16 million by 2050. Look to the person on your left and on your right. Statistics tell us that when the three of you reach 80, one of you will have Alzheimer's. So my venture capital background made me ask, why haven't we made more progress? It's not for lack of researchers. There are talented scientists at our best academic institutions and our teaching hospitals. But I have concluded that the financial model for funding academic medical research has severe challenges. It's insufficient, it's inefficient, and it's ineffective. It's insufficient when in Alzheimer's we spend $1 on research for every $400 on caregiving. It's inefficient when some of the best scientists at our leading academic centers spend 30 to 40% of their time filling out forms in search of funding and then sometimes don't hear for a year. And it's ineffective because the grant-making mechanisms of many organizations have become so conservative and so risk-adverse that the funding they do give is for studies that advance the ball one yard at a time. Fortunately, there is a new movement, a philanthropic movement, which is designed to accelerate cures. It takes venture capital principles and applies it to research funding. It was started by people like Mike Milken with his prostate cancer work and his Faster Cures organization. And today, many disease-specific nonprofits have adopted the venture capital model, including Cure Alzheimer's Fund, which I co-founded five years ago. The venture capital model is simple. First, proactively identify world-class researchers in your disease and fund them. Second, relieve the researchers from bureaucracy. Give them an answer in weeks, not months or years. Third, network your researchers in a virtual organization and insist that they share their data and their results promptly and collaboratively. And fourth, challenge your researchers to dare to be great, to give you projects that, yes, have some risk, but if successful, will advance the ball 10, 20, 40 yards down the field, give you a venture capital-like return. I'm confident that if this venture research movement grows in the next 20 years, like venture capital grew in the last two decades, then at a future TED-Med conference, we'll be talking about a real cure for Alzheimer's. Now let me introduce Dr. Rudy Tanzi, a world-class geneticist, to update you on Alzheimer's and to share with you how his venture research funding has helped his career. Thank you. Thank you, Henry, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, every 72 seconds in this country, a new case of Alzheimer's is diagnosed. 40% of our population at the age of 85 will have this disease. That's pretty scary when lifespan is approaching about 80 years old right now, especially with all the baby boomers coming around. 
As a result of this, we calculate that by 2015, Alzheimer's disease will single-handedly begin to totally collapse Medicare and Medicaid in this country if we're at the same spot we're in now, which is we have zero drugs that can treat this disease and stop it. We have drugs that treat symptoms temporarily with some benefit, but they certainly don't hit the disease. Now we heard from uh, Jay earlier, I like the comment about frustration breeds imagination. And I think this is a perfect lead in for what Henry and his colleagues, Jeff Morby and Phyllis Rappaport did in starting a venture research fund, Cure Alzheimer's Fund, to take the bull by the horns with the goal of ending Alzheimer's disease by 2020. And if you think that's a crazy idea, uh, in today's New York Times, in, a, in an editorial by Chief Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Stanley Prusner, Nobel Prize winner, they say, just as President John F. Kennedy in 1961 dedicated the United States to landing a man on the moon by the end of the decade, we must now set a goal of stopping Alzheimer's by 2020. So we're not alone. And I believe we can do this, and the way we will do this is through genetics. So let me say that, for, first of all, everything we know about Alzheimer's today has come from studies of genetics. Before that, it was the, men in the blind men in the room feeling the elephant. And because of genetics, we can basically try to take a pharmacogenetic approach. That means use all of the genes, and we'll need to know all of the Alzheimer genes, and there will be dozens, probably over 100, so that we can predict the disease early. We'll know who's at risk early on, look for warning signs with biomarkers and imaging, especially those at risk, and most importantly, stop the disease before it starts. So instead of saying cure Alzheimer's, we're gonna end, we're gonna eradicate Alzheimer's by predicting it early and preventing it early, and to do that, we need to know all of the genes uh, that cause it. So let's start the story in 1906 um, when Alzheimer, aptly named, uh, first described this disease. He described the pathology in the brain of a patient, uh, senile plaques outside the brain cells, in the brain cells, they were being choked by these tangles that kill the cells. And then in 1987, the first Alzheimer gene came. So for decades, we had no idea what caused the disease. And then in the 80s and 90s, the first real clues came. We found four different genes in that time period that gave us actual physical targets for what was actually where drugs had to hit to stop this disease. So what do I mean by this? Well, the, what we do with genes, and this is the Alzheimer gene shown here, is genes give you a drug target, and then the genes also teach you about the biochemical pathways where you must hit at the earliest choke point to stop the disease. I think a perfect example is, is heart disease. So um, if, if you basically uh, look at heart disease, what, what was the uh, target? This is, again, genetics uh, first led to this. Brown and Goldstein, Nobel Prize winners, told us this decades ago. What is the main target in heart disease, anybody? Preventing heart disease? high cholesterol. And this, this came out of genetic studies originally. So this was the target, and then as a result, the pharmaceutical industry got to work and came up with statins, statins like Lipitor. And what they do is, if you look at this pathway, A to B to C, this is the cholesterol synthesis pathway, and a statin hits the production of cholesterol at the very first step, that rate-limiting first step, and thereby you can, uh, you're able to take this drug and keep your cholesterol levels at a safe, just at the right amount, together with diet and exercise. And as a result, there's been a dramatic decrease in the incidence of heart disease um, in this country. We need a statin for Alzheimer's disease. Genetics to tell you if you're at risk and you need to monitor more carefully, and then we need the equivalent of a statin for Alzheimer's. But first, we need a drug target. Well, luckily, the genes that we know about have given us the drug target. The drug target is a little protein, a peptide, called A Greek sign beta, A beta. And you'll see a picture of it here, it's that little U-shaped thing. And these little guys get made in the brain normally, but if you make too many of them, they start to aggregate and they start to cause problems. So you need some of it, just like cholesterol. You need some A beta in the brain, but not too much. Now, this is the most scientifically complex slide I'll show, but I need to show it to explain how we're gonna to get to the choke point. We have to target A beta, how do we get to the choke points for drug discovery? A beta, is embedded in a much bigger protein called APP. That was the first gene we found. And that little uh, A-beta has to be snipped out by two enzymes, enzymatic scissors, and the second two genes we found, called the presenilins, actually help make those clips. And now the A-beta gets made, and normally you make so much in the brain, and the fourth Alzheimer's gene, APOE, helps control how much A-beta accumulates versus being cleared out. 
And you need a beta in the brain because we know it has nice roles, like it, it actually can fight infections. Um, it can also uh, control synaptic firing. So you heard yesterday from Francis Jensen that when you have excitation, you can't have too much or it will have a seizure. A beta seems to play a role in quelling that firing so you don't have too much. Now the problem comes if you have an insult to the brain, a stroke, traumatic brain injury, maybe a, a certain neurochemical infection. And what happens is you start to produce more A-beta, because A-beta is made as a more of a, less a reaction, a response to the brain to something going wrong. And now if you have too much A-beta, too much of a good thing becomes bad. A-beta starts to form these clusters, so you get plaques with the helps of metals, zinc and copper. But most importantly for Alzheimer's, if you have too much of the A-beta, it gets into synapses, where nerve connections are being made, and it blocks neurotransmission. Alzheimer's disease is just as much or more a learning disease as it is a memory disease. We often say, oh, well, my grandmother can't remember what happened five minutes ago. No, she, it's not just she can't remember it, she never learned it. You can't remember what you didn't learn. If you're not making those, those synapses and connections correctly and they're being short-circuited, you never learn in the first place. You never registered what happened five minutes ago. Too much A-beta causes this problem. And so to treat this disease, we look at this as the kitchen sink. And this is the ugliest sink I could find on the internet, a nice ugly green sink overflowing with water. So if you have too much amyloid in the A-beta uh, uh, protein in the brain, what do you do? You turn off the spigot or you clear out, you, you unclog the drain. And this is exactly what we've attempted to do with the drugs. You try to curb the production of the peptide or try to clear it out. So that's the good news is that we've, we, we basically have drugs we, we have the target, we've come up with drugs to try to do this. The bad news is that so far, the anti-A beta drugs have failed. Either they're not safe enough or they weren't potent enough. This means we need to do better. We need even more choke points. How do we do that? Well, again, we go back to how we got here in the first place through the genes that basically set us free and teaching us about Alzheimer's. And we need to find the rest of the AD genes. I say this because those four genes only account for 30% of the genetic puzzle of Alzheimer's. So this is when I uh, uh, first met Henry and his colleagues and we started, we had this vision of an Alzheimer's genome project where we would use these chips where you can test a million DNA markers around the whole genome and find where the rest of the Alzheimer's genes are. But to do this was very expensive. At that time, these chips cost $1,200 each. We had to do thousands of samples. We weren't gonna get that money from the federal government. And this is where venture research funding came to the rescue. And as a result, we completed the Alzheimer's genome project um, and uh, this was named a Time Magazine Top 10 Medical Breakthrough. But more importantly, scientifically, we went from just four genes to now over 100 Alzheimer's genes and all kinds of new choke points to hit A beta. Um, and this, and as, as you might imagine, the more choke points you have from gene to clues from genes, the more drugs you can try, the more shots on goal to cure the disease. So, at the top of this slide shows where we were. We were just trying to very specifically block the production of A-beta or clear it. But what, in, in a single concept, what the new genes have taught us is it's very much an issue of the incels to the brain, the vasculature. Why do many of the same genes that cause cardiovascular disease also lead to Alzheimer's? Um, why do the same genes involved with stroke also lead to Alzheimer's disease? It's because the insults have to trigger the disease. The insults trigger the A-beta. And then the brain has an immune response to these insults, and that's genetically regulated as well. So what we're learning from these new genes is that uh, basically we have different choke points. So we have the original choke point here where we have drugs called gamma secretase modulators. These have a good chance to be the statins of Alzheimer's. They, they slow down the production, they're in process. We have different drugs that can clear the A-beta out. And from the new genes, we have a whole new choke points where we can control the insults that trigger the A-beta production and your own response to those insults. Very, your genetics dictates how you're gonna to respond to a stroke a traumatic brain injury or a neurochemical. If it's too overly robust a reaction, you might make too much A-beta. Genetically, we can learn now how to control that as yet another shot on goal for treating this disease. So I think we've made great progress, especially thanks to the venture research funding mo uh, model. We wouldn't have been able to do this without it. We now have over 100 Alzheimer's genes getting closer to this goal of early prediction, early detection, and early prevention. So I believe, just like many other diseases that threaten healthy aging, we will eradicate Alzheimer's, hopefully by 2020, through pharmacogenetics, stop the disease before it strikes, and use genes to do it. Thank you very much for your attention.